still, there we go. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining our very first Nelly community event. I'm Katrina Peasley, Nelly's director of community here. Um, and I am so excited to chat with Mike Rowland today, owner of Animal Training and Development here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, about a topic that is so near and dear to so many of our hearts, our four-legged fur babies, and preparing them for the arrival of our two-legged babies. <laughs> so right. um, we appreciated all the questions that our members submitted ahead of time. Um, and then if if any of you have any questions during the event, go ahead and chat them and we'll address them as we need to. Um, so Mike, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this field? Sure, uh, well, thank you for the opportunity and thanks to everybody out there for thinking ahead uh, before the baby arrives at how you might uh, smooth things over with your canine uh, companions. And I really love the you know, people that are proactive. And of course, it's it's never too late to ask for help, but the earlier in the, the process that you think about it, the the more time that you have to, to make changes if changes need to be made. But uh, I basically have been training dogs professionally for a little over 30 years now. And during that time, I've trained over 18,000 dogs. So it makes me feel old to think about Gosh. that, but it's been uh, a lot of How adventure, a lot of fun. How have you kept track of trading 18,000 dogs? Sorry. <laughs> so really when I first started, I used to take pictures of every single dog and got little Aww. notes from their owners. And I had a big scrapbook. And when that filled up, I started another one. And then as I started to uh, get busier and started to train nearly a thousand dogs a year for some years, I gave up on the scrapbooking. And so basically uh, over the years, I conservatively averaged uh, the number yeah. and that's how I came up with the 18,000. Wow, that's that's a lot of experience. <laughs> and <laughs> what's fun about dogs is there's always something new to learn. So I've done, done everything from basic obedience to uh, agility and fly ball and search and rescue and shits and sport and uh, therapy dogs and service dogs. And um, the only thing you won't see me doing is dancing with dogs. So that's where <laughs> I draw the line. <laughs> That's for reality TV, right? That's for reality TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. I read on your website that you are or have been an expert witness in dog related like cases or trials. And I never even thought about that as like an avenue for this career or this path. So um, I think that's really interesting. How many times have you done that? Uh, I've done that three times. They've all been yeah. bite uh, type cases. Oh, okay. And yep. So mm -hmm. um, these cases um, and the three times that I was asked, uh, turns out some people deserve to be bit and the dogs won. So uh, <laughs> it, that just so happened to be the, the way it worked out for the, the ones that they asked me about. So yeah. I, I've done that three different occasions and I've had some other uh, great fun. I got to go to Las Vegas on an impromptu mission to help Steve Wynn, who was the CEO of the Mirage Hotel, and he wanted to uh, make his big golf course public accessible, but he wanted his protection dogs to have uh, ability to protect his immediate property. So I was ah. hired as a consultant to go out there and, and help with that. And so uh, that was kind of a surreal day, uh, but pretty fun uh, getting picked up in a limousine, taken out to the property. <laughs> and so there's a lot of adventure in the dog world. And uh, you know, up and coming, I'm looking forward to training trainers. So if anybody yeah. out there is interested in a fun career that is different every day, um, let me know. Yeah, that's, oh man, that's so exciting. All the different opportunities you've had. So that's very neat. Um, so yeah, we can kind of jump right in, bring it back closer to home a little bit. Um, so I want to look at this, this talk in like two chunks. So we're going to be talking about preparing before a baby comes and then what to do to prepare, um, after the baby arrives. Right. So Mike, what are some of the first steps uh, a new mom or a family can take to prepare a dog, their you know, current dog for when um, a newborn comes? Sure, I, I think the very first thing to do is kind of take a look at your lifestyle and your home. And much like you would childproof a home and you start to think about, well, you know, the baby's gonna come and of course a newborn isn't gonna be a toddler, but it won't, won't take long. And, you've got a toddler on your hands. And of course we start worrying about, you know, medicines being locked away and, and cleaners and stuff like that. And so the, the cabinets, you know, being uh, locked tight and, and just uh, ins and outs, um, 
you know, transitions and, and things like that um, are all things that you can start to think about early in the in the process. So how are things going to change when the, the baby arrives? And of course, you know, you've got uh, more things carrying out of the house. Is this going to present, you know, a bolting opportunity for your dog to try to take off? Is this going to be, um, you know, a, a problem when you start to, you know, take the baby, you know, up the stairs? Is the dog excitable going up and down the stairs? Is going to cause uh, potential accident. So you want to think safety sake and just kind of consider the routine that you're going to have, you know, where the baby's going to sleep and how that's going to um, interact with where the dog normally sleeps and just little things like that, that you can kind of think ahead and, and start to plan for. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I thought about, which I know we have a couple of dogs, we have a, a baby and a toddler, and we try to designate like this is the dog's area, this is where their food is, and neither kid can access that area. So I think that's Wonderful. something that kind that's of goes kind along of with that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And just like every person needs a safe place, you know, if, if you want to be alone, you know, you should have a, a safe area that you can go to. A dog always needs that as well. And so uh, crates or kennels, you know, type thing is often what people choose. And, and I love that. But you want to think about if right now, it's kind of in the middle of, um, you know, a high traffic area, trying to think ahead of when the baby's going to be there and maybe start to even position that away from the high traffic areas where the baby's going to be moving uh, back and forth. And, and so the dog has that quiet place away from all the, you know, activity and, and drama as the baby starts to get vocal and, and things like that. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, is there anything that we can do to acclimate our dogs to, you know, the, the sight of a newborn or their sounds or the different smell, um, anything ahead of time that we can do to prepare? Well, one of the things I always encourage uh, mothers who are expecting is if you're living with the, the dog, uh, the dog is already very familiar with your baby long before you know much about it. And it's, it's just amazing the sense of smell that dogs uh, have. So I'm sure if we could ask the dog, they could probably even uh, do the sex thing on our, our baby before we know as well. But the uh, fact of the matter is, is uh, oftentimes mothers, um, parents will try to bring back an item from uh, the hospital that has the baby scent on it. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. Although the dog's probably like, yeah, I, I know that's the, the baby I've been smelling for the last nine months. And so uh, it's, not a, it, surprise, right? it's not a big surprise for the for the dog when you bring this this baby home so they're very familiar with with it already and so that's that is encouraging for a lot of people when they just don't realize they think this is the first time this dog is going to uh, encounter this baby now it's the first time they may see the baby but it's not the first time they've encountered it so they're pretty familiar with it already yeah yeah that's interesting i never i didn't really think about that like i know there, I, I see videos online where the dogs are really sweetly like laying on the mother's like pregnant belly and they recognize it. And sadly for me, my dogs did not do that. They were just kind of like, I maybe they were just annoyed already <laughs> with the idea <laughs> of of a little one invading their their space. But um, yeah, I love I love to see those videos when the dog like, you know, you can visually see that the dog is recognizing that um, there's going to be a change. And yeah, I think that's that's fun. So. Um, in, in terms of, you know, it's a big, it's a big shift in routine, um, after a new, after a newborn comes. So is there anything that we can do to help our dogs prepare, um, when pr prepare for a change in their routine, because it's going to be a huge shift. So is there anything we can do ahead of time, um, to prep Absolutely. them in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I feel like although you may not have direct contact with newborn babies for your dog to kind of train around, we've always had a saying uh, here at Animal Train Development that distractions are to dog training as weights are to weight lifting. So if you're really strong, you can lift a lot of weight. And if a dog is really well trained, they can work through a lot of distraction. Now, of course, we don't, don't like to think of our babies as a distraction, but the bottom line is anything that that it is different for the dog is, is a potential distraction, whether that's a person riding a bike down the street or another dog walking the other way on the sidewalk. Uh, and so if you go out and start to um, help your dog get better with distractions that you have available to you, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Things like the school bus stop, that's a wonderful place to start, you know, especially with young kids, if you can take your dog out and, and start to teach it to be calm around the kids and learn that sitting is how they get their attention and the, the man behavior that dogs often do because they're excited, jumping up and pawing and barking and licking. Although these are you know maybe sometimes fun for a little older kid, they can be pretty overwhelming for a newborn. Of course, as parents, we're a little protective over the, the newborn as well. And so we want to start to teach the dog to be calm around mm -hmm. um, excitable kids. And another one of my favorites to start to train dogs around is, at least in the summertime, if you can get around community pools where, you know, inside the fence, all the kids are running and laughing and, and jumping and splashing and playing. And you can take, you know, a dog around the outside of the fence and start to condition it to kind of just um, sit there on the bleachers. And uh, by our park, there's a, a set of bleachers right there that you can sit. Just have your dog just hold the down command and just watch the kids play. And every second the dog is watching kids acting out and, and being goofy and, and just being kids it, and not acting out themselves is the second they start to get desensitized to that type of uh, stimulus. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, same thing, if you can even record uh, a movie, maybe where a baby's crying or, um, you know, some dogs are really into watching TV and some dogs don't, but <laughs> most of them will pick up on the sounds, you know, from the TV, uh, even if they're not watching the, the show themselves. Other dogs, I'm sure, follow the plot right along with us. They really <laughs> pay attention uh, to TV. So if your dog's like that, you can you know, get movies that have, you know, babies on it and, and things like that to help, you know, condition them ahead of time as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. But it's it's like kind of like exposure therapy, you know, that some people right. go through to like, yeah, um, just get used to an experience by just diving into it. Exactly. Um, we do have a question from one of our members. Um, does the dog's personality ma matter when thinking about how to prepare them or how they will react to the baby? So maybe talk a little uh, bit about dog personalities. Absolutely. In fact, um, you know, I invented a system we call dogality. So you've probably taken personality quizzes over the years and they're always a lot of fun. And at the end you find out, well, you're like this animal or you're like this color or you're like this thing. And then they say, you know, based on your results, we think that you'd probably like a career doing this sort of thing, but you may not like a career doing that sort of thing. And it's interesting that you can go and evaluate a litter of puppies. And um, when I first started as a dog trainer, I took it to heart that the AKC knew everything there is to know about dogs. And so my grandmother used to get the big book of breeds every year, and I would just dig into that. My friends were into baseball cards. I was into dogs. And so I was studying <laughs> the different breeds and dreaming about all the ones I was going to have. And a lot of my decisions were based on what they said the dogs were like, uh, behavior-wise and temperament-wise. So I always wanted a German Shepherd because, wow, they're brave and they're courageous and they make good police dogs and they're really smart and they can lead the blind and all these cool things. Um, but when I got out in the real world, I started to realize, wow, there's a lot of dogs afraid of their own shadows that are also called German <laughs> Shepherds. And what is up with that? And maybe they're just bad breeding or something. Uh, but as I got into the profession, I was actually hired by a couple to go help them find the ideal uh, German Shepherd for them. And I went and evaluated a litter of puppies by a breeder who had been doing it for 30 years. And out of the 10 puppies, um, most of them were so different from one another that you just wondered if one had been abused because it was afraid, it was in the back, and it was growling whenever you got near it. Others were running over the top of some of the other pups just to say hi to whoever walked in the room. Mm -hmm. Some were kind of uh, pushing the others around, kind of like bullies. And so I invented this system. It's got five roots. And so you have a dominant, outgoing, guarded, supportive, and submissive uh, root of dogality. And usually sure. they're going to break down into a blend. So like my German Shepherd kind of fits the description of what you, you think of. She's got the high dominant with an underscore supportive dogality type. And so it really does matter um, what dogality type your dog has as far as how they're going to perceive any changes in their environment and how they're going to likely react to any new uh, stimulus. And so if you've got that outgoing dog, although they're very friendly and don't know a stranger and they don't have a mean bone in their body, they do tend to be a little over the top and they don't respect boundaries very easily. Yeah. And although they would never purposely try to injure a baby, they're the kind that kind of get clumsy and can knock, you know, little kids down and, and make them cry without ever meaning to. But the guarded dog outie types on, and these ones, you know, again, people look at them and sometimes they assume they were abused because they act so withdrawn and, and so um, aloof. 
Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that's a legitimate dog Audi type and each one has pros and cons to it. So the plus side to a guarded dog is in their immediate uh, circle of trust, you cannot be loved any better than by a, a guarded dog. Uh, if they had a sign on, on one side, it says, I'm not a hugger. And if you just come up and hug them and they, they don't let you, they don't want you to, then you're going to get a growl or worse. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you flip that sign around, the guarded dog sign would say, but if I choose to hug you first, you'll never have a better hug in your whole life. And that's pretty much the <laughs> truth. And so um, you have to just kind of be uh, aware of what dog alley your dog that you have currently is. And if you haven't chosen a dog yet, then, you know, thinking ahead to having a, a kid of your own or two, and then of course them having friends, it's very important to kind of think about the lifestyle that, you, that you're going to live. And very rarely does a garter dog really fit into a family type of lifestyle, at least an active family. Uh, type of lifestyle because they don't like changes. They want everything to be very predictable and um, they're, they're not into surprises. And so um, they would be kind of stressed with a life like that. Now, that's not to say that you can't make uh, adjustments and help a guarded dog adjust to uh, a baby. You certainly can. It's just not as easy as it would be for some of the other dogality types. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what I'm gathering is really breed does not matter. It's more about personality, the dogality of the Absolutely. dog. Absolutely. You and can have any and, breed you yep. like. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any breed you like, and you can have mm -hmm. one that fits uh, the bill. I've worked with an awful lot of pit bulls that are just wonderful uh, children dogs. And, you know, of course, you know, the media won't let you think that that's true, but right. I can tell you from my own experience that there's some of the best, you know, kid lovers out there. Mm -hmm. and so, Sweetest. Uh, there's yep. A, Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, I love that. I love I love that whole idea of dog alities, like the the personalities. And I think you know we we talked about this a little bit before how so many dogs' personalities mirror their owners and everything like that too. So I think I know that's true for my dog. <laughs> like, uh -huh. yep. Yeah, they say yep. it, you know those cartoons always have like the sketch and. The and the dog kind of looks like the owner, a bulldog looking dog with a kind of a stocky, you know, guy with, a, you know, the two jaws and everything. And uh, they look alike. But I find that more than not, they act alike, too. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. you outgoing person. Typically, you've got that outgoing dog. And such is the case with, you know, dominant type of people. So I think we're just subtly just attracted to dogs you know, that remind us of ourselves. And I mm -hmm. think that kind of is part of it, too. Yep. Yep. That makes total sense. Yep. Um, and just to kind of kind of close out like this first this first chunk, are there are there any resources or training methods that you would recommend for parents preparing their dog for a new baby? Ideally, um, scientifically speaking, um, the time for socialization is from birth in a puppy all the way up to 20 weeks or five months of age. So okay. if you're fortunate to have a chance to go pick a puppy before you know, this baby arrives, the most important thing I think anybody can do, including myself, I've often said, if I didn't own my own dog training school, I would still take my new puppy to a puppy class somewhere else. Uh, even though I don't need help training the puppy, I certainly need the help socializing. So if you mm. find a good place to socialize your puppy, uh, and again, the window is pretty narrow. So from birth until 20 weeks. And once they're past 20 weeks, that window uh, kind of shifts. And now they're into more adult style thinking and, and they're not as open to the socialization uh, style techniques. But if you can get that puppy into a good quality socialization puppy class where they're letting it play with other pups and they're passing it around the group and the puppy's getting exposure to a variety of different people. So we always invite people to bring their children and, and the more the merrier, bring your friends. We would, you know, welcome people from the street if they would come in and hang out in our <laughs> puppy class because we just want these puppies to get a, a wide range of different people to handle them. And, and like a good preschool, you want your puppy to learn that learning's fun, that learning's rewarding, that everybody's nice. And then as they get older, they're ready to take on, you know, the more stressful type of adult style training. But uh, even if you didn't get the early socialization, it's never too late to go out and at least start to desensitize your dog to what you know are common triggers. So every dog has what we call their kryptonite. You know, Superman was super strong until he got around kryptonite and then he, he wasn't strong at all. No matter how well trained your dog is, every one of them has something. You know, for uh, my dog, it's furry 
creatures like rabbits and squirrels <laughs> and uh, other dogs. It's a ball or it's a bike or it's a car or it's another dog. There's always something. And if you take the time, even with an adult dog, to go out there and kind of help your dog get through that, now you've built up mental endurance for that dog to be able to take on further stresses like with the new baby and stuff to mm -hmm. uh, do. So you can start to build your dog's ability to kind of accept change and change its behaviors and look to you more as an authority figure, uh, somebody that they can trust and respect so that when you tell them to stand down and say that's enough, that they can say, all right, well, I'm thinking I should really freak out right now, but since you've told me that I should stand <laughs> down, I trust and respect you enough to, to do that. And so you can practice that around other things uh, long before the baby comes and, and that will prepare you better for when the baby does arrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of uh, answers my question, you know, can an old dog learn new tricks? And Absolutely. It seems like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, old definitely. people are harder, but uh, <laughs> old dogs can certainly learn new tricks. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good to know. <laughs> All right. So let's shift into after the baby arrives, baby's born. First time the parent is bringing their, their little one home. Um, what are some ways that we can manage a dog's behavior to just maintain that calm and safe environment for the baby? That's a wonderful question. And, and this is one of my favorite conversations because it occurs for people, whether there's a baby involved or not, let's say it's, it's a stressful scenario. And we often deal with dogs that have, you know, dog reactivity and it's you know, stressful for these folks to even to try to take a walk because they turn the corner and their dog wants to lunge and pull and bark at other dogs. And it's a, it's a very dramatic type of event. But the first training that we do isn't with the dog in that scenario at all. It's with the person. And the mm. first thing that we really want them to understand is this concept that we call the two R's. And the two R's represent relaxed and ready. And so the saying goes, um, you want to be relaxed and ready at the same time. Uh, meaning I'm relaxed if I've got my dog on a leash. And, and I notice that when people get stressed, the very first thing they do is they tighten up on the leash. Well, that sends that anxiety right from your body, right down the leash, right into the dog's body. And so even if they weren't stressed before, as soon as we get stressed and we get tight, now your dog is going to start to mirror those types of emotions that you are sending to them. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can't always control the way you feel, but you can always control the way you act. So we tell people, remember to breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, keep slack. And especially I can just imagine, you know, the stress uh, when you first bring that baby in, you just want everything to go so perfectly that you're going to be tense. Naturally, you're going to be tense. Mm -hmm. But if you remember to breathe and you remember to keep your body language relaxed, that takes such an edge off of the uh, emotional environment that that'll help a lot. But at the same time, you got to also still remember to be ready. And it's a it's a fine line that we walk, because if I'm so relaxed that I'm not ready and I'm not really paying attention to the dog and it comes around the corner and jumps up on me and knocks into the baby, that that's not good either. So we want to keep in mind, be relaxed and be ready, but never be so relaxed that you're not ready and never be mm -hmm. so ready that you're not relaxed. So it's kind of that, <laughs> that you know, so type, contradictory, type Mike, <laughs> a little bit. But that's the paradigm that we try to get people to, to start to experience. And again, it's a lot easier to experience that you know, starting out with your dog's particular kryptonite than it is, you know, with yeah. your dearly loved baby that's coming home for the first day. So again, you know, take some time and get out in the world and start to learn, how do I um, get through this issue that I know my dog has, you know, with a, a treat that might drop in front of them. If my dog is so mm -hmm. treat crazy that I can't get it to sit as I drop a treat on the floor in front of them, what's going to have happen when the baby you know, drops its bottle or what's going to happen, yeah. you know, well, stuff like that. And, and so you just have to, you know, start to think ahead, you know, well, if I can get my dog to hold a sit and not even think about breaking ease and I'm bouncing balls in front of it. I had a border collie that was so ball crazy. It probably took me <laughs> two weeks to get him to be able to hold the sit as I bounced the ball. But before it was over, I was able to bounce balls and walk circles and roll balls by him. And uh, he never lost his love for a ball, but he was able to work <laughs> around them without losing his mind. So that was, yeah, good. yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm just imagining that like, you know, the first time like a parent brings their new baby home and it's that, you know, that protective motherly stance, like stance and trying to, trying to manage that with introducing them to the new dog and, and yeah, not like being calm, but also ready. And like, I, yeah, it's such a, it's such a balance. Like you said, such a balance. 
Here's an idea, so. you know, thinking of that mm. whole scenario, because you're right, I, that's exactly how it goes. But what if we think about that ahead of time and new mom who's expecting, but not too far along to carry a bag of groceries, uh, comes <laughs> into the house with a bag of groceries. And meanwhile, uh, whoever's there to help, whether that be a spouse or a child that might already be there that can hold a leash on the dog and start to teach it that, hey, you know, we may even come up and ring our own doorbell and I've got a bag of groceries with a lot of good smelling stuff inside. Mm -hmm. uh, can we start to already condition this dog to to be, you know, calmer and, and more stable uh, minded as we walk in with high priority type of things, maybe even from the pet store, you know, some dog treats and a bone and sweet toys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you can do an awful lot to get your dog prepped for these things. And it doesn't take a lot of time. This is what I always tell people. And it's amazing how fast dogs can pick up new patterns, but we just have to go through the motions. So we're not talking hours a day uh, to get this done. We're talking minutes a day over yeah. the course of maybe 10 days. And you can, you know, have your dog prepped for not just the entry through the door, but, um, you know, think about giving the, the child a bath and think about, you know, the other mm -hmm. things that you'll be doing, changing diapers and just the little things like that, that you can already start to put in healthy habits for these types of routines, um, just going through the motions, even if the, you don't have the baby there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that technique. Yeah. That's a great idea. Um along those same lines what what are some ways that we can kind of foster those positive interactions between the dog and the baby so it's not always it doesn't always seem like contentious or like you know that kind of thing sure so once the dog gets into that calm state of mind and, and i'm amazed at how dogs you know, have gifts you know and that's why i guess we hooked up with dogs uh you know thousands of years ago they just kind of mm -hmm. have this capacity uh, because they're pack animals just like we are um, they have this this kind of natural capacity to kind of see uh, new members of, of a pack and they, they can sense your your connection to them and so they, they sometimes even big giant strong goofy dogs get super calm and super relaxed and when your dog is in that uh, kind of mindset you know this is the time you know to let the dog come up to maybe the chair that you're sitting in and get a, a sniff and, and they're being calm and and relaxed and you're calm and relaxed and they're just starting to get to know things um in their own mind and then you know you've got this dog is your your kid's best friend for life and so uh, you just take the time to you know make sure nothing goofy happens in the first couple of introductions and then you just start to as you feel like you can trust uh, the dog more you start to let it investigate a little bit more and uh, I've always said that it takes two things to have a good relationship with a dog. And it's the same two things it takes to have a good relationship with a spouse or with a friend or with a coworker or with an employer. It, it takes mutual trust and mutual respect. And if mm -hmm. one of those is lacking, the relationship's in trouble. And if both those are lacking, well, that's when people usually find a new job or get a divorce, you know? So what we're trying to do is make sure that we're nurturing both those things. First of all, with the dog and ourselves, and again, I, I would tell people take on some of those triggers that you know your dog has. Every dog has something and uh, take those on before the baby arrives, but then use those same styles of techniques when the baby does arrive. But when you see the dog is in that state of mind that you can trust them more, then you let them get closer and get in, you know, investigating in a little bit. And typically the babies, they want to reach out and squeeze anything they can. Yeah. And, you know, and you see that dog kind of, you know, get that happy look on their face that they got touched by the baby. and. You do their little prancing routine and that's when you want to get it on video because you're so happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, so this, this next question I have struggled with for probably the last three years and it's about balancing, balancing our attention that we give to our dog when we're also trying to take care of, a new baby and that that shift in attention like my you know we had our two dogs for five years before I had my son and then it was such a drastic change for them and you could sense it that they you know they weren't the center of of, of, uh, of attention anymore um so I wonder if there's any any techniques or recommendations you have there yeah, and that's a tough one because obviously yeah. your schedule and, and lifestyle is going to change when the baby mm -hmm. comes and you're probably not going to be sleeping very much. And even if you had time uh, to take those normal walks that you were doing uh, before, you're probably not going to feel like doing that um, in the first beginning stages of, of the, the new uh, baby. But 
Um, you rest assured that the dogs are some of the most adoptable animals on the planet. And so mm -hmm. any kind of new routine is usually more stressful for the humans involved. Like when people move, they're asking a lot of the same questions. Well, what do we do when we move with the dog? And usually it's a lot more stressful for the people moving than it is for <laughs> the dog. And same thing with the baby. It's probably going to be more stressful on the on the parents um, than it is the dog and, and they'll maybe have a little excess energy. And certainly if, if somebody can continue, you know, at least a, a nightly walk, if that's been your thing, maybe it's mm -hmm. a shorter walk, but if you can still just go through the motions and get, you know, 10, 15 minute walk in with the dog. So they are getting their, their quality time. Um, and unlike humans, dogs don't really have the, you know, capacity for things like jealousy. Now they certainly get anxious and it can look like mm. jealousy. But they're not sitting around saying, wow, life was so much better before you brought this kid <laughs> around here. Can't believe what a ripoff, I, you know, this is. And uh, no, they don't yeah. think like that at all. Now, they may act anxious. They may act insecure. They may even act mm -hmm. like a little bit um, to where they're going at some avoidance behavior. But, you know, it's the people that take on the guilt of all that and say, well, wait, my dog doesn't like the, the baby. It's really not that as much as the dog is trying to figure out, you know, where their place is now. And the, yeah. and the whole pack and and what to, is the expectations and, and things like that. But usually in the course of 10 short days, all that starts to dissipate and things get into a, a regular normal uh, routine or a more normal routine for uh, with the addition of the baby. Mm -hmm. And I think this could also speak to like what you can do ahead of time before the baby is born is maybe trying to get them used to a new routine of like doing a nightly walk versus something earlier in the day or whatever it is like getting them yeah. into the habit of so it doesn't completely shift their you yeah. know their routine um so yeah interesting um so as the baby grows it becomes more mobile what do we do <laughs> when this happens um it, it's so it's so challenging because they go from in like being immobile to just moving around. And like right now my one-year-old is just following our dogs all over the place. And I know right. it can get annoying for them. So um, what are ways we can mitigate that, that yes, tension? That's a great question. You know, I, I cringe when I see some of these pictures where, you know, um, somebody's put the little baby on top of the sleeping dog and, and they do a photo op. And, um, you know, even if the dog tolerates it, it's kind of a foul, you know, in the mm -hmm. sense that here, here a kid is starting to already get conditioned. The idea that this is kind of fun and or some dogs will just tolerate it and, and never have a problem with it. And especially as a dog gets older, things start to hurt that didn't used to hurt. And, and now, you know, and in pain, the dog can react. And so what we're trying to teach is, you know, proper, um, you know, ways to approach a dog. And this could save a kid from being bitten by a dog that isn't as friendly as yours someday. So, you know, we don't just walk up and, and hug the dog when it's sleeping. You know, my grandmother always used to teach us, you know, the old let sleeping dogs lie thing. And <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't believe her until one time I scared uh, one of her dogs and turned and snapped on me. It never bit me, but it's, it hurt my feelings i was like you know really upset that you know um, my loved dog would do that to me now i don't think she did it on purpose i'm looking back i think right. i just freaked her out you know she just woke up and was surprised uh, but i remember what grandma said from then on and you know <laughs> you just make sure the dog's awake and aware that you're coming and you just go through the proper you know procedures of you know, letting a dog maybe sniff the back of your hand before you pet them and just let them kind of you know know that you're there um, even as an adult, and I've been a trainer for over 20 years, I had a Jack Russell Terrier that when he was asleep, you had to make sure he was wide awake before you walked past him, because if he wasn't <laughs> wide awake when you walked past him, you'd be lucky to get past him without uh, <laughs> without him snapping at you. So, uh, you know, just you know, kind of respecting boundaries of the dog, kind of making mm -hmm. sure that, um, that, that the dog and the kid both know that if they get out of line too much, you know, they, they can, you know, kid goes to the corner and the, the dog goes to the crate and we break them up and let them both think about their, their life choices and then you know, mm -hmm. kind of reintegrate them back again. And typically the, 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 the kid and the dog become the best of friends and they're inseparable. And, and like you said, it sounds like your kids are already you know, chasing the dogs around and, and yeah. wanting to be where they're at. And that's how I was wherever Shane, my grandmother's dog Shane went, I went and it was just a, a wonderful memory, you know, looking back on it. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she always taught us proper respect of the dog that you don't just hug it, especially if it's asleep when they're eating, 
you, you leave them alone. You don't want somebody mm-hmm. messing with your food when, when you're eating. Um, and we don't want to mess with the dog's food when, when they're eating. If they're playing with their toy, you know, you get your toy. You don't go mm-hmm. take their toy. You know, just little things like that. You wouldn't want somebody to come take your toy. And, you know, you, yeah, even two or three years old, I remember my daughter being able to start to learn these kinds of concepts. So, you know, um, they can start to pick up on these things. And, and typically the, the dog is so much more agile and athletic than, than a, a younger kid that if the, the kid is bugging them they can just get away and usually that's what happens you know dog just run up the stairs or run to the yep. back room and, and stuff like that and that's what i encourage my dogs to do is like if you go to your safe place and everybody needs one i'll make sure that you stay safe there so especially mm, as kids get older yeah. and they have friends and there's a birthday party and you know a dog gets a little stressed and they go to their little safe yeah. place we have to make sure that we we protect that space for them and same thing for the kids if they you're stressing you, you know party's getting too loud for you and you need a little time out when you go over here this is your spot and and you're welcome to go there anytime you want and we're going to protect that for you too so uh, just making sure that we're thinking ahead and, and treating others as we like ourselves to be treated and that goes for dogs too would go a long way in avoiding problems yeah yeah i like that idea of just like having the dog needs its own safe space as well and just to to go to right now we are struggling with um my daughter like i said she's chasing the dogs around and she one of our dogs tolerates tolerates the kids um toddy is a jack wire haired jack russell terrier and Mm -hmm. she is very friendly with my daughter but letty will grab her hair because she doesn't have control really just yet but um and toddy thankfully doesn't like freak out or anything like that and i've been just trying to trying to like calmly just ungrip Letty's hair mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. push, you know, like let Toddy go, just let her, you know, do her own thing and not freak mm-hmm. out about the situation. But um, I think I'm lucky in the way that Toddy has been handling <laughs> things right I, now. That's a great that. technique. So. And along those lines, you could also, this is a, a thing we do in every one of our puppy classes, but it's never too late to desensitize a dog you know, to have in their paws touched, to touch in their ears, to touch mm. in their tail. Yeah, you know, getting you used to start that. To, yeah, even with people that are adults, if, if we just start doing it, and then when the kid does it, it won't be such a surprise. And of course, we're trying to coach the, the child as early as we can, but we're yeah. trying to prep the dog for these unexpected, you know, things to as much as we can as well. So, you know, if I come up, you know, and I, I touch your tail and you kind of spook a little bit and turn around, well, there's a treat for you, good dog. And pretty soon they start associating <laughs> these these, you know, intrusions, you know, with a, a reward like that and, and it desensitizes them to that sort of thing. And so between oh, okay. the two, you can really uh, mitigate any any problems uh, yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so kind of getting back to like, like basics of, of you know, knowing how your dog reacts, um, what are what are some signs um, that a dog is feeling stressed or anxious, especially yeah. around a new baby. Sure. So, um, you know, panting is, is natural, especially if your dog's right. hot. But if your your house is, you know, uh, air conditioned and your dog is, is panting like it's it's hot, that can often be a sign of stress and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, a dog that goes into any kind of avoidance mode uh, where they're just kind of turning their head away from where the action's going on, or maybe they're even mm-hmm. trying to go to a different area. Um, I always tell people when, when that happens, let it, let them go. If they want to go and, and find a safe place, when they come back out, then we can make a big deal over it. Well, hey, welcome back. It's good to see you. And we can start to re-immerse them in, but don't force it on them. You know, we don't want to have to, you know, make the dog tolerate um, this um, as much as we want to make the dog um, just a appreciate it you know just to kind of fit in uh the way we we would like instead of force it on them and so look for uh, avoidance type of behaviors um hair raised up on on your dog's neck you know i've always told people that that shows the dogs in what we call a heightened sense of awareness it doesn't always mean there's something you know badly wrong with it it could just be excited yeah. so i don't read too much into it unless it's also um supplement it with other types of body languages that tell me there is you know kind of an issue you know if the lips being lifted up and maybe a, a little bit of a mm-hmm. growl you know that side eye look that they get ears pinned back tail tucked you know all these things kind of 
you know, lead us to believe the dog is feeling stressed and, and anxious. And so uh, when you're stressed and anxious, it isn't a great time to learn something new. You yeah. know, you want to, you know, take a nap and come back with a different attitude and, and just re-engage, um, you know, a different, more subtle way. And there's always ways that we can buffer we call it buffering distraction. So if, if my dog is full on ball crazy, I can't just bounce that ball right in front of them. But if I turn my body so that I'm bouncing the ball to the side of my body, my dog can hear the ball bounce, but can't see it bounce. That's kind of buffering that distraction a little bit. And there's ways that you can buffer, you know, whatever is happening with the introduction with the baby. So instead of presenting the baby face first right to the dog, which wouldn't be the uh, great way to start, you know, you start with maybe just the baby's blanket without the baby even attached. You know, you remember the smell. It was in, you know, the, the, the mama's belly for the last nine, nine months. Mm -hmm. But here, here's a blanket it smells like that, too. And <laughs> I familiarize them, you know, that way. And, um, you know, just kind of um, those type of ideas. Remember, you can always buffer a distraction to where it's more um, doable for the dog. We, we, we say the art of dog training is to make thing, uh, training sessions challenging but doable. If it's mm. too doable and it's not challenging enough, you know, a dog gets bored and they don't really get, um, you know, um, anything new learned. Um, if it's too challenging and not doable enough, well, just like us, you know, you get frustrated and you get anxious over it and, and you don't want to do it anymore. And so you're trying to find that nice balance, uh, what's challenging but doable. And you break it down into small doable steps that are challenging. And it's just amazing. Uh, we always say 10 days to success. It doesn't have to take a year. Uh, in 10 days time, you can do an awful lot of good things with a, with a dog. Mm -hmm. Kind of along those same lines, what, what happens, like, what should we do if a dog starts showing aggressiveness or aggression um, when, when yeah. we bring a baby new, new baby home? Yeah, obviously you want to immediately, you know, get a dog to a safe place and keep them apart. And this is the time to call, you know, professional, um, okay. you know, from there, you know, you can do an awful lot. And a lot of times it, it can be navigated fairly quickly. Um, other times, you know, a veterinarian may have to get involved and prescribe some anxiety medication mm -hmm. uh, sort of thing. And other times it's, it's just not a workable environment for a certain dog, uh, dog alley type, uh, like mm -hmm. I say, the guarded ones are typically the more challenging of the bunch to, to navigate new things. But although they may react strongly at first to a new thing, once they've, you know, settle, settle down, it, they can become the most loving of all dog alley types toward uh, family members. And so they just have to get that extra time and proper techniques uh, to make those adjustments. And so I would, again, I would highly recommend getting a professional involved. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, are there any, just in your experience, are there any like common mistakes that, you know, new parents make when they're introducing a dog to a new baby? Um, I think we may have talked about some, but what are some things yeah. that we should definitely avoid? <laughs> yeah, I, I think they, they just get a little over the top, you know, just a little bit too excited. It's, it is an exciting moment. Uh, and they're just not keeping the two R's in mind, you know, that whole being relaxed mm -hmm. and being ready. It's pretty hard when you're super excited. And I get that. I remember, you know, when I first came home with my son, uh, when he was born, and I had an Akita in those days and I uh, also had a Rottweiler and, you know, I ran in there dancing and hopping around like a goofball and it worked out fine in, in the case, mm -hmm. that, you know, that I had there, uh, but it's probably not the best strategy. You know, if you just come in with a, a little bit kind of, you know, I can take a few breaths before I go in here. I know I'm really excited, but we're just going to come in and say, hi, you know, how are you doing? Here's our new little baby. You want to meet, you know, so-and-so and, -so. and yeah. you know, just kind of, you know, go through um, the two R's would be my best recommendation. And, you know, um, again, remember to breathe, remember to try to keep your body language, you know, relax, but also, you know, stay aware and ready uh, at the same time for, you know, goofy things like jumping up or, you know, um, just tripping over your own feet as you're navigating the living room floor with the baby and the, <laughs> the blanket, you know, trailing and all that goofy stuff and again if you practice with groceries that's a good way to get yourself yeah. up <laughs> yep yeah. i like that technique <laughs> <laughs> all right well i think we we covered so much today um and i just you know i want to ask is there is there one piece of information we have those two r's we have the dogality types um is there one piece of information that you would really like our members to take away from today's session um 
you know, if they wanted to do like a fun quiz, we have a dogality quiz that we can yeah. give out and people can answer the, the questions and then we can send them a certificate. Now, this would be for the person. But oftentimes, mm -hmm. like I say, people tend to subconsciously pick a dog that's like them anyway. So it'll give you some insight right. as to uh, not only what dogality type you are, but what, you know, maybe dogality type you have. And that can give you a lot of insights. And once I know what a dogality type is, like our trainers, when we have a conversation, I can say, well, I met Miss Smith yesterday and her dog is a high dominant underscore outgoing. And immediately we all know exactly what we can expect, you know, when we go meet this dog ourselves and, and we know how it's likely to react in, in different environments. And so uh, getting a little heads up on, on what you're dealing with there will give you a lot of insight. So mm -hmm. if you guys go to our webpage, it's dogtrainersinc.com. At Dog Trainers Incorporated, just the INC dot mm -hmm. com. Um, we're looking to put that quiz right on there. But in the meantime, if you go on there and just click on our email address and ask for it, we'll make sure we get that sent to your email. You take the quiz, we'll send you back a nice little certificate that kind of explains um, the dog alley type that you you tested for, and that gives you insight as to what one would best fit your your personality. Um, and then from there, we can kind of talk more about your dog if you like as well. Yep. That's great. And we will be sure to um, share your information with all of our members so that they have that and can connect with you if, um, if they want to look into some dog training and dog alleys and everything like that. Um, Mike, I am so grateful for you for doing this event with us. Um, you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this. I've learned, learned so much. Um, so I'm so thankful that you joined us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's so much fun. And uh, thank you for all you uh, folks out there thinking ahead. And uh, best of luck to everybody. Yep. And um, just so our Nelly community members know, um, if you joined late or had to duck out early, we will be posting this recording to our Nelly community um, in a couple of days. But um, otherwise, we hope you have an awesome rest of your week and take care. All right. Thank you again, Mike. Thank you, guys. Take all care. right. Bye. Bye.